uh, another Schwecky Business Booster uh, webinar. We made a couple changes over here on this end. So hopefully, you can uh, you can see my bright, bright and smiling face as uh, we talk through uh, different strategies about growing digital readership and digital revenue. You know, things um, that's really important for me to note uh, in the onset of our spending a little bit of, of time together is that a unique opportunity um, to work with about 75 different uh, publishers on a monthly basis. And I'm really pleased for the opportunity and blessed to have that opportunity because it really allows me the ability to be able to operate outside of any type of corporate bubble. So a couple things to promise you as we talk through these digital revenue and digital readership ideas. One, I never share something with you that is not being used or something in the past uh, for one of my customers. That's a, an absolute uh, you know, promise uh, to you. The other thing is that I promise I'm not going to agree with everything that I say. <laughs> I say that very often. I'm um, to understand that, that there are things that are going to always be shared about digital revenue that are just going to either rub you the wrong way or you're just really not going to know, okay, how, how would we ever in a million years, how would we implement that? It's just, you know, a lot of cases, it's just not going to be possible. So through these ideas, pr please remember those two things. One, you're probably not going to agree with everything, and that's okay. Implement what you can, and at least give it some good consideration, okay? And the other is, I promise that I'm never going to share it with you if it's not something that, you know, you can't do or, or I don't see my customers doing on a regular basis, okay? All right, so first of all, uh, tip number one for you today. And tip number one is, and we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but let's dig in deeper. I want you to consider having a big data plan. And a big data plan is, is many faceted, but let's talk about this. Number one, big data is all the rage. Everybody is talking about it in some pretty vivid detail. It's important for you to understand this, and I believe it. He who owns the data is going to you know, you know, dark at the end of the world. You know, I hope a couple things will happen. You know, one, I hope that I'm in a, a better place with uh, pearly gates, okay? <laughs> and the other is I hope I don't, don't see a Google logo, okay? Because right now Google owns the data. And so great data raises the value of your company by as much as three times. Recently, I know of a company uh, that was in the Upper East Coast that sold, and they had a great print publication. It was a wonderful marquee publication. But in their total business valuation, it came to light that they was willing to pay two times the money that they would have normally paid because they had really good, well-organized debt. So I want you to consider as you think about having a big data plan to understand that it does add a lot to the company. And it's important that you give it a lot of consideration. Big data is important. Advertisers are really looking driven resources. So you have to ask yourself, what is it that you do to collect? What are you doing to funnel this data down into some type of database? And then what are you doing to, to mine that data? Over, I think that it's important that all of us really talk in, in vivid detail about big data because it's very, very important. All right? Number four, advertisers are looking to us as media professionals for data leadership. They know they need to do something with data. I'm sure that a lot of them are collecting email addresses and, and, and things like that. But for us, what is it that we're going to specifically do, specifically, to make sure that we have big data and we have a big data plan? So what would a big data plan specifically look like? Number one, we have an inbound data plan, meaning we've got promotions going on. We've got strategic partnerships in place. That would be the first uh, thing that I want you to consider and think about. Number two, do you have a data growth plan, meaning are you getting basic data and are you expanding it, you know, or are you trying to collect all that data at one time? Maybe what you might want to consider is this, actually surveying for data piece by piece. How do you do that? Well, depending upon the service provider that you choose, if you're running surveys or you might have my name, you might have Ryan Dorn's email address. And at the onset, say in January, you ask, okay, many times a year, Ryan, do you golf? Okay, that's one piece of data. Let's say that I say five times a year, which is not true. <laughs> Don't my wife. I golf a lot more than that, okay? Five times a year. Then you can send me out another 
another question, a real simple question. That's you know, when you do golf, is it for business or is it for pleasure? Sometimes you don't get good results from a survey because you ask just way too many questions. So maybe you can ask that data and grow it a little bit at a time. So that's called a data growth plan. Number three, what kind of tools are in place to mine the data? As an example, there's a company uh, out of Plymouth, Minnesota called Knowledge Marketing, or KM uh, for short. Sure. Really people, really nice software product. What that software, and there's a lot of people that do it. I just happen to know those guys. What software allows you to do is take the data that you have in place and mine it, and then use that data. Now, obviously, you're going to look at a piece of software like that and go, wow, that's really expensive. Guys, again, go back to one of the initial points that I made before and right as we began this webinar. Let's just say that you spend, and I'm making this number up, $50,000 on data mining software. What are you going to do with that data to sell fifty dollars to $100,000 a year with that data or sell your advertisers into that data? Let me give you an example. Let me explain to you, you know, really how this uh, works. Have a good data base in place. And let's just say, for an example, you use the knowledge marketing tool set. Then go to an advertiser, and I can say, not only do I have female readers, but I can do when female readers open emails. I can do and target the readers like shoes. I target in people that even like red shoes, as an example. Because you can actually begin to target messages very, very specifically, very specifically to very unique users. You might say, well, Ryan, wait a minute, pause for a second. That small of a group of data, say you have 5,000 female readers, and you've drilled that down to 10, which you're charging a lower amount for that data. Absolutely not. The more, the more realized, the more nights you can get that data, the more expensive it is. I mean, just imagine if you were someone that sold women's shoes. Just an example, and I'm making that up. And I'm able to target messages you have about a particular set of high heel shoes to a particular user. The chance of someone buying that grow exponentially. And the cost of the advertiser over the long term actually goes, goes up a little bit because they're going to send out one email blast. What they're able to do is send out very specific targeted messages. See, big data is, is absolutely critical. Then you have an internal data use plan. I mean, what are you going to do with the data? Are you going to clean it? Are you going to sell it? Are you going to use it to grow the value of your company? What are you going to do with it? See, a lot of times I'm going to, I'll come on location, just as an example. I'll come on location and spend an entire day going through, okay, what is your big data plan? What do you do with that plan? How do you use that data? How are you going to sell it? How are you going to price it? All right? And number five, you're going to need some type of data sales plan. Some type of very specific plan of what you're going to do with it. Remember, guys, I say this all the time. It's mission critical and in place. Remember, all the experts say failure plan is planning to fail. You have to figure out very specifically what you're going to do with the data. Now, if you're sitting there today and you're saying, you know what, Ryan, I don't have any idea. I don't know where to start. You need to hire to give you some outside help. That's fine. If nothing else, you really need to begin the conversation. If you're looking to grow digital revenue, if you're looking to grow digital readership, one of the things you need to focus on in the next two to five years is what are we doing with our data? In my opinion, and I'm not trying to sell my services to you. Well, I guess I sort of am just by being here. But what I'm trying to do is help you understand that you may need to get some outside help. Put your head in the sand. Be careful. Someone else is going to do it. If you don't do it, Somebody else will. So think about it and get it. All right. Tip for growing your digital readership and your digital revenue is understanding responsive website design. Responsive website design. What, is, what does that mean? What responsive website design means is web template or change changes to the place that it's being viewed on. So let's just say that you have iPhone here, okay? When I look up a magazine website, it looks 
good on the phone, but it works for that device. Now, some of you might be saying, well, yeah, go to my phone, pull up my website. It pulls up. Okay, how many times have you been to a website on your iPhone and you've got to zoom on it and zoom in on the menus? It doesn't work for an iPhone. It can appear on the iPhone, but it doesn't work correctly for an iPhone. What happens is responsive website design, okay, responsive website design, allows your website to work correctly on an iPhone, on a book, on an iPhone, on an Android. That's what responsive website design is. Now, some of you might say, Ryan, I have a mobile a website in place, a mobile version of my website. That's great. What that requires is a separate template. Well, responsive website design is, it is allows your website automatically without a completely separate template to morph and work on platform agnostic. So what you want to do number two, as you see on your screen, is you want to choose a management system or a web company that understands this concept. Number two, you want to have IT use a new template. Think about this. Go to the team, talk through it, and figure out, okay, what can we do to really you know, make this work? Now, you might ask yourself, well, Ryan, I just really don't know that it's that important. Folks, it is mission critical to your success in growing digital readership. You need to be like Burger King. You need to give it to your readers the way they want it. Any way that they want it, if they want it with onions and pickles, give it with onions and pickles. If they want it plain, ketchup only, that's how you need to deliver it. If you don't, somebody else. By 2015, all white-collar homes in America, in the United States, will have a mission a minute or two tablets. That means you need to look not only when you have an iPhone or a tablet, you need to ask yourself, does it actually show up on there, but does it work correctly? By 2015, smartphones, such as your droids, uh, phones, whatever version you have, your Samsung Galaxies, they're going to outnumber PCs by 2015. So smartphones are going to outnumber personal computers. I mean, guys, remember something. You see this gray hair, okay? <laughs> I remember. When the first computers came out, shoot, I remember when fax machines used to come push out one single long piece of paper. Do you remember that? Although I remember when people used to cross to place an ad. So <laughs> my how times have changed, right? Responsive website website design really bridges, okay? The app see many of you actually don't need an app. Love what you do. My my goals with my customers is to do the best to save you money. Some of you actually don't need an app. You just need responsive website design. All right, so here's an example for you. Notice right here on your screen you've got community, the Community Impact Newspaper Group, okay, offices in Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, etc. When you actually go to impactnews.com, this is how it looks right here on your web. Look at it in your iPhone, this is how it looks. Metro Publisher Platform, uh, put them up on the screen to share them with you just because I have so many customers are happy with Metro Publisher. Um, they don't need me to, uh, to use them or anything like that. I just like to share with you people that are working, that work for my customers. So you notice the website is here, and this is how it works, and then it's here, and that's how it looks on an iPhone. And I, I think it's really important for you to understand that's what responsive website design should do. In the end, it should be a ton of money if you pick the correct System. And digital readership tip number three, Google. Google let's talk about it. Number one, Google Spot. Okay? So understand something, and this is a, I'm going to be spending um, about an entire day uh, in Atlanta teaching a, a class on editorial standards for Google, meaning we're going to put a bunch of editors and we're going to talk together about what does Google look for in content. Google does not do clever. I mean, that's one thing that they don't do. Google is a robot. So if you are a group, a magazine, an organization that has really clever writers, which a lot of writers are, your headlines are killing you. Headlines are not keyword rich. They're, they don't follow your core keyword segments. So if you grow digital readership, you have to bring more website traffic to website. Say the other day, you know, 
you know, the web, are, are people still using the web? I mean, aren't they all just on their mobile phones looking at websites? I mean, are they actually using the Internet? No. They're using the Internet. The Internet's not going away. And if you get found by Google, you're dead. You're absolutely dead. If you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. So first of all, identify what is your core keyword set, meaning what are the five to six phrases, okay, five or six terms that you use that you want to draw in website traffic with. You want those terms and phrases to be very, very specific to the content that you have. Let me give you an example. You are targeting high school sports with your magazine, just an example. And some of your key phrases are high school sports, but let's say that your main town is Tulsa, Oklahoma. So your key phrase might be Tysa, Tulsa High School Sports. So if the keywords on your website is just high school sports without Tulsa, then competing against everybody on the Internet that might be for high school sports. The title tags, okay? Is your editorial team tagged, or uh, trained rather, to tag these articles correctly? Using Tulsa High School Sports. The line might be the title bandits with the eight to eight, just as an example. It's a good line, some eyes, but it needs to say at the end of it, comma, something like high school sports. Ask yourself, does your content management system allow you to put your core keyword sets into the titles, into the data? Anything you can do to have Tulsa High School Sports in that document? Does your editorial team understand that care about that headline, that 58 to 8, Google's not going to care. Your team very rarely gets money spent on them. The sales team, shoot, I train salespeople at six or eight calls to this day, but I don't train editorial teams. Because the publisher, hey, what kind of training are you doing for editorial this year? Oh my, uh, I don't even have that in my budget. Something. It's, it's mission critical for you to train your, editors, your editors each and every year on best practices of SEO. 85% of publishers think that golden when it comes to search engine optimization. Why is that? Because they go and type in the name of their magazine, they pull it. SEO is so much more than that. If you write with Google, you're dead. Because if you grow your digital readership, your viewership, you have got to be with Google. you got to get right with Google. Doesn't that say that? Remember my dad saying to me, you got to get right with God, Ryan. Well, I'm telling you, you've got to get right with Google people if you're raging success. Ask this. How many searches do you do each month to grow 25%? Meaning if you wanted to grow your revenue 25%, how many more people do you need to buy a website? I can answer that question for you just in a generic way, but I think it's a really important question. And it goes right to the fact, Google or AI. You know, we barely spend 5% on editorial training. 95% of it is spent on sales training. I want to encourage you to attend conferences, attend webinars, get some training for your editorial team, Google or die, everybody. All right, tip number four. Do anything we can in organization if we want to grow digital readership and do anything we can randomness on the occasion. You do no one on your organization should be the king or queen of random land. I mean it's important. Randomness is something that we absolutely have to put a stop to. You know, I'm a process guy. I have to be a process person or just not going to get stuff done. I need a process for everything. I think I'm going to get it done and it's not going to happen. So what I want you to do to doing is, number one, identify random patterns in your sales team, things that are random way. You really need to focus on creating more disciplined sales efforts. Those that you see on your screen here is the magazine manager, Again, not a company I'm paid by, just a company like in terms of helping uh, publishers and their sales teams stay organized. And also, just a randomness, there's this this that if you work smarter, you don't have to work as hard. Work smarter, not harder, people will say. Listen, it's critical for you to understand that you work 
harder in this digital landscape, you're going to work harder. What, who is the biggest competitor? Who is the competitor? I know who it is, and I don't even know them yet. It's two guys or, or a woman in their garage. Those are the people that are going to outwork you. you. You might think they're going to outsmart us. Probably not. You're probably not than they are. Probably. You have better content. You probably have better infrastructure in place. Well, they're going to outwork you. They're going to work harder. You got to think. Ramp patterns cause massive distraction and disruption of your day. So if you have no digital revenue, you've got to come up with more processes. How to handle leads that come into your website? What happens with them? Are they put into an auto autoresponder system? Do they likely, uh, are they sent back a sales video? What happens if someone comes to your website in the middle of the night and they Advertise. What happens? Does it say, sell you back in 24 hours? That's bad. So bad. Now what do we have now? No way, Jose. If they come and request sales information from us, and 9.30 at night and no one's around, they're going to get an immediate email back that says, thank you so much. Here's a link to our media kit. Check it out. Here's a sales video on each of the projects or the packages we have going on. You need to come up with a self-service sales path. Create your paths. Now, practice often and practice right. If you want to make sure that you're top of your game, when it comes to digital conversations, you have to practice those conversations. Don't put them on your advertisers. That's a really bad thing. And lastly, but definitely not least, is use C tools like the Magazine Manager or others that are out in the market uh, to track. I, I honestly don't know what I would do Uh, magazine manager and some other resources on a daily basis uh, just because it helps keep me on track. If you're getting them, if you're guilty of randomness, it's going to kill your efforts, okay, to be a digital sales success. Right. Tip number five for digital revenue and digital readership, this is going to cover both, and that is you need to have a promotions calendar for your team to work from. It's really easy to do. It's really straightforward, and it's not going to take a ton of effort. You just need to do it. It's really hard to sell. Okay, let's see. It's hard to sell something that's out there, and the most promotions don't get sold. The sales know about it, or it comes up at a very, very uh, last minute. So your editorial specials, okay, to the seasons, match your promotional calendar to the seasons. It's really straightforward. It's a very simple way to handle it. What I'd like to see is you to have you for you to have a whiteboard, okay, up on, on the wall of your office that you cited, okay, with a black electrical tape that lists out your editorial topics and issues and then lists out the promotions that you have coming up. And the is the same needs to know what can they sell in the future. That's what a promotions calendar or a contest calendar means. Remember something. The one single driver of a besides just your magazine Google, okay? So kind of the third thing, driving traffic to your website, is going to be contests and promotions. And it's so unbelievably important for all of you to, to understand and embrace that you absolutely, it's imperative, imperative that you're advertising and promotional calendar. Now, if you don't know what to do, maybe you don't survey, you don't know what to present or whatever it is, say, survey for the best results. Ask customers, hey, are your readers, what do we give you Okay, that would get you excited to come back to the website. The example I gave you uh, probably several several months ago, so from this again, it's about three years together uh, through Shweki, is that we're managing HorseCity.com, which grew the largest equestrian portal on the internet. We asked, what do you want to win? What's the one prize we could give you that would cause you to tell all your friends? This was even before Facebook came out. And the one said, wasn't saddle. said, oh, man, Ryan, are you kidding me? How are you going to give away a horse? I said, let's figure it out. We were members to 130,000 members in 30 days because we gave away the right uh, contest item. And the nightmare, oh, absolutely, it was tough to make sure that the person that won it was qualified, that a veterinarian went and visited their home or their facility, uh, that we got someone to deliver the horse to them. I mean, it was just, it was a, 
absolute nightmare. But guess what? It worked. Now, should you go to that extreme? I don't know. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to go from zero to 130,000 members in 30 days. You do the right, right stuff. Partner with the right advertisers. Make sure that the prizes in, in a general rule are uh, easily over the $500 mark. All right. Now, you are going to want to consider using this type of contesting software to boost your success. Now, one of the companies that I really like is Second Street Media. Pay me. I just mentioned them to you because people always ask me, hey, Ryan, you know what companies do your customers use for success? Second Media is another one. Now, Facebook contests no longer require an approved app, okay? Um, and that's a selling point for Second Street over the course of the last several years. You do things on your own on Facebook with a contesting app, but I'm telling you now, you've got to be very, very careful. If you do it wrong, They'll shut down. And when you shut down by Facebook, the chances of you getting turned back on are to none. So some have heard, hey, Ryan, you know, you need a Facebook app anymore to run a contest. A, you can use one because good Facebook apps are going to help drive the contest. They're going to store the data. They're going to help you with the prize delivery, things like that. Remember something, if you don't use an approved app, I mean, you're just, uh, honestly, you're really asking for trouble. All right. Tip six. Sell exact readers to all right. So I want to put big data into action. And I alluded to this a little bit with my red shoe example of women's shoes. You want to ask yourself, what information do advertisers want? And you could ask them, okay, what, what exact information do advertisers want? You want to you want to know what does an advertiser really want in a new customer? What's the sex of the person? What's the age of the person? How uh, they live? How income? I mean, you can actually get down to the real nitty gritty and deliver some really good digital results uh, to these folks. One of the things that, that you'll see, the, the place, I'm sorry, let me back up. The place you'll see this in action is with Google. You notice sometimes, let's say you're on Google and you're researching a, a car cruise or something like that, okay? You're doing a search. And do you think that when you go back to Google and you're searching other things, all of a sudden you start seeing advertising that's related to a past search of yours? Yeah. Why is that? It's because they're collecting data on you. That's that's the essence of big data. So, so I'm talk about this a little bit. I don't want to go into great detail, but just remember that retail advertisers demand a lot of specifics. With tools, you can really collect and, and mine it. And, you know, one of the companies I really like uh, for this service is KM, Knowledge Marketing. Um, you can find out who that person is, what they do, what they buy, why they buy, when they buy, who they buy. I mean, precision sales is our future. I mean, it really is our future as publishers. It doesn't mean we're going out of business with, with prints. It's not at all. As we, we've talked about it in the past. As readers evolve from being print readers to digital readers, we're going to have to sell and be a lot more uh, specific. Okay? All right, number seven. My customers are having great success selling expert videos. Advertisers are very often your very best uh, experts, your very best experts. So you want to you know, feed off their ego, if you will, and ask them to help you create, create unique videos. Now, these are not videos where they're selling their products. Okay, let's give you an example. What they are is their videos, um, as an example, let's just say here on my screen, I've got tax advice uh, from, from somebody that's a tax expert, and I want to get them as an advertiser. I go to them and say, hey, what I'd really like to do is a series of 10 tax tips. Okay, one tip for video. Each is just, you know, five, five minutes, uh, I'm sorry, two to three minutes long. Okay? You do then, you actually go and you build these in a very, very simple way. Now, that tax consultant, CPA, whatever, is going to be an advertiser magazine or on your website. That's the only way they can be one of your video experts. Then you can see on your screen right here, okay, which is you just bring in a very straightforward and simple video camera. You record a tip at a time. You do it all in one sitting. What I like to do is I like to work with my advertisers and do maybe 10 videos that maybe are a minute to five minutes max, maximum, in one sitting. I don't do editing. It's really straightforward. It's very simple. Readers love it. Absolutely love it. 
Now, is this paid content? I say no. I do not think this is paid content. Now, I say, well, we could get a video on our website is if they're an advertiser. This is a privilege. Now, content, in my opinion, is what gets on there, and they just talk about their products. That's paid content, in my opinion. Now, this is one of the points where you might disagree with me. You know, listen, don't get lost in the weeds. If you're looking to grow your revenue, it's mission critical. Absolutely vital that you explore expert videos. I can't think of anybody, anybody that would be on this call today, watching this webinar today, that this wouldn't apply to. Okay? You might say, well, I don't have a video team. Guys, this doesn't require a video team. This is really straightforward. I could mean, actually hire a videographer from any market across the country for less than $500 in most cases to shoot these videos for you. You might be able to do some trade with them if you're a seasonal magazine. You know, guys, you got to get creative if you're going to make some money, you know, in the enterprise in the digital space. I call it Print Plus. All advertisers get these special opportunities. Now you say, well, Ryan, I give this opportunity to anybody that's in the digital space that really wants to be with me in on some type of digital way. Okay, cool. You handle it how you want to handle it. I reward my print advertisers. I want my print advertisers to have really first access to kind of really, really cool stuff. All right? Okay, tip number eight, and this is a question I get all the time, so that's why we're going to address it. And we'll, uh, you know, one of, our, one of our last tips for today. And then, Ryan, how do I sell social media? You know, what do I do? Okay, first, you need to create litmus test. You need to start with the editorial team. You need to say, listen, if we're on the Facebook feed, what do we to look like? Because each commercial post must have some type of reader benefit. You can't get anywhere by putting stuff up on your Facebook feed. It's going to make your readers angry. Commercial posts must have a reader benefit. Okay? Commercial posts, in my opinion, I only do one commercial post. Ten, ten editorial posts. Now I'm saying, <laughs> Ryan, you do ten editorial posts a month. Okay, then that's a problem because it demands a high interaction. Facebook demands it. So it's really important for people to recognize that you know if you want to do it, I mean you're just going to have to get on board. Okay, you're going to have to get on board. Now, next, what do you charge for it? Well, the average ranges from seventy-five dollars. To one twenty-five dollars per thousand users you have engaged, okay, uh, on your Facebook page. So, so let's just for example, you have fifty thousand fans or likes. That's the number. What you do is drill into your Facebook analytics and find out how many people are actually engaging or doing something with your posts. That's the number they sell off. For example, you see here. Here's something from the Houston Chronicle. Okay, it's clearly sponsored content. Check out these four things to keep your home safe. So clearly it's sponsored content. And it's got a nice big picture. It's though that you really look at your Google, your uh, Facebook analytics. Here's an example. So for a certain post right here that happened on 6 4 13, three engaged users. Okay. Now I know for a fact that this particular page here has about 300, 400, 500 likes. But when they post something, only about three people at a time engage with it. So that's the number that I have to sell off of. So in this case, for 75 bucks, I probably couldn't even get away with that. But you need to dig in deeper. Okay, you need to dig in deeper on the media to really understand how many people are actually engaging with posts. And in one of our next Shweki calls, uh, what we'll do is we'll really dig into social media in a much deeper and more uh, vibrant way. All right? All right, tip number nine is a review of something we covered earlier in our call, and that is you just got to give it to people the way that they want it, all right? And here's an example that I gave to you uh, probably maybe three months ago. Tablets, okay? The person you see on your screen are four people. The kid on the Brazil and the kid on the left is Andrew, okay? They're, they're hoping, us parents out there, that these kids are going to graduate college, okay? They're expected to reach their career path by 2022, Digital readership and digital revenue 
really got to ask yourself, who's your Dylan? You got to ask, who's your Andrew? And you begin to craft products today that are going to get them excited. Because someone else is going to do it. Let's just say City and Regional Magazine, all right, and cover Boston as an example, Chicago as an example, okay? Or cities here and there in between, it doesn't matter. You have to ask, what products, what are creating that targets these two boys? You need one, or you need your own Andrew. Get a picture of them on your on your wall. You need to be saying to your editorial team and your sales team and your writers and your options people and everybody, what are we doing to these kids? What are we doing to help grow them to be our leaders of tomorrow? Oh, Ryan, I don't have time to focus on that. Oh, Ryan, you know, if I had time to focus on that, I'd maybe be a millionaire. Here's the thing. Remember, guys. your digital readership, your digital revenue, that you pull your head out of the sand and you realize that it will be here sooner than it will be here tomorrow before it's going to be here six years from now. Some of you still believe that you will see, you will never ever see a day when things are not printed on paper. Now, some of you that are watching this webinar are 85 years old, okay? Maybe that will happen to you, okay? That you will be your maker before for stop printing things. It's important for you to understand that, that while the business is extremely vibrant and many, many years of strong print growth very ahead of us, it's important that you recognize that we've got to figure out ways to grow our digital revenue. And one of the ways is by figuring out who we hope that our future readers will be. And I encourage you to look at a picture like this and, and push the screen and ask yourself on a day weekly, my basis. Hey, who is our future reader? And what are we doing now to get these guys? They're not kids. I mean, these are 14 years old. These teenagers, what are we going to get them on board? Here's what you might consider. I think what I would do is I would make sure that all these kids, all of these kids are a part of the reader advisory board. Wouldn't that be cool? Put them on the reader advisory board. Really something that makes a, a ton of success for them to be part of your growing organization. I say, I don't know, people, you know, they don't listen or they don't feel like it's important. I put 14-year-olds on my advisory board. I encourage to have high schoolers on your advisory board. Shoot, maybe you don't even have a reader advisory board. On the advisory board, you should have a couple of advertisers. You should have a couple of readers of various ages, demographics, and, 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 and sexual makeups in terms of men, women, kids, okay, different ethnicities. Put it on our reader advisory board so that you can understand what people want from you digitally and what the advisors want from you in, you know, in a revenue perspective. I applaud you for taking time today to webinars. I think what is doing with these is incredible, and it's awesome, and it's been a major success for the last three years. So kudos to them for doing this. Kudos to you for watching. Just for something, guys. If this was easy, everybody would be doing it, and they're not. So if you want to grow your digital readership, you want to grow your digital revenue, you need a plan. And there are 10 tips there for you to, to use walking forward. Hey, always, I always offer a 25% discount to all Shweki uh, media customers, so reach out to me if I can be a help to you. And remember something, our futures in this business, in the magazine business, are very, very vibrant and bright, and I encourage you to keep looking towards the future because there's really a ton of great things ahead. I'm from Brain Swell Media. Thanks so much, everybody, for hanging out with us today. And again, as always, thanks so much to the fine folks at Schwecki for these webinars available. If I can be of assistance, and best to you as you work, grow your business to a great digital success.